Take our um, Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Genesis and uh, chapter number 8. Genesis chapter number 8. And uh, as you're turning there, on uh, Sunday mornings we've been studying through the book of Genesis. And um, um, the book of Genesis is a foundational book. Um, and much of what we see in the book of Genesis uh, impacts and the rest of what we read in the Bible. And so therefore, our, our knowledge of Genesis is uh, vitally important. It's the book, as we've said, of beginnings. Uh, it all begins with God. And we've already observed from the first few chapters uh, that God is interested in man. And uh, to me, as we've looked and studied the opening chapters, uh, I am uh, more convinced now than ever uh, that God's love for man is not equaled by anything that we've ever read or seen. Uh, his desire again, and it begins in Genesis, is to redeem to himself a fallen human race. Uh, that has been his desire since the beginning, and we see that it continues to be his desire. And something that I think we've already observed now that we come to chapter 8 is already that God is gracious, merciful, and long-suffering. And uh, that is clearly what we see in the opening chapters of Genesis. Think about it. Uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and God calls to Adam and Eve and says, Where art thou? He is seeking to redeem man back to himself. When Adam and Eve had uh, Cain and Abel, we know that Abel offered an offering that was pleasant to the Lord, but Cain offered something that was not pleasing to the Lord. But notice how God uh, sought for Abel, he said, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And then as we see the two uh, generations, we have the generations of Cain, who lived independent of God, and then the generations of Seth, who depended upon God, and who began to call upon the name of the Lord. We know that the human race, those two generations, if you would, the ungodly generation and the godly generation, kind of came together, and the whole world was corrupt. And, saw, and God saw the wickedness of man. He saw that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And God said that his spirit would not always strive with man, for he is flesh. But then he said that he would give man 120 years to come back to him. Now we know during that 120 years, Noah would preach righteousness. And the message was, repent, because the judgment of God is coming. And the flood came. And for 120 years, God was long-suffering to man. He strove with man. He contended with man in order to bring man back to proper fellowship with him. Now, we studied last week that the flood came. And Noah, by faith, trusted in the Lord. And we see that eight people were saved. And two of each of the animals in the earth on that day of every kind was saved. And now we come to Genesis chapter 8, and we will study the chapter this morning, and we'll read beginning in verse 1 in Genesis chapter number 8. And notice here what the Bible says. And God remembered Noah, and every living thing, and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assaged. The fountains also of the deep, and the windows of heaven were stopped. And the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. After the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventh day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month, in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, where the tops of the mountains seen. And it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the windows of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the earth. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and so returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her, and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days, and again he sent forth a dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah, uh, so Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. 
And he stayed yet other seven days, and sent forth a dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl, and of cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kind, went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living, uh, everything living as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now I want you to notice, I want to draw your attention here, because once everything has been done, the flood came, and now the waters have abated. And uh, God speaks to Noah and says, it's time for you to go out of the ark. And he gives Noah some specific instruction. But I want to notice this morning the first thing that Noah did. The Bible says in verse 20, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, in verse 20, and of every clean fowl, and offered and burnt offerings on the altar. And the Bible says, The Lord smelled a sweet savor. I want to preach this, many, uh, the, this morning on this thought. After all this that we've seen, there is only one thing to do. There is only one thing to do. Now, as we've studied here in the book of Genesis, it is no doubt that as we've observed that man was created as the crown of God's creation. Uh, the Bible tells us in chapter 1 that God created man in His image, in, the, in His likeness created he, he, uh, Him, both male and female created He them. And so man is a special creation, and we notice off the top that uh, we are separate from the animal kingdom, from everything else in this world. And if there is one part of creation that reflects more than anything else who God is, it is man, for He was created in His image. And so we find that God, after He created man, the Bible says He blessed man, and He gave man, and He told man to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moveth upon the earth. And so we understand that God gave uh, in the hands of man everything that He created and said, you're in charge. You have a responsibility, and we know that Adam and Eve had responsibilities, and we saw that uh, they fell in rebellion and we, they plunged the entire human race into sin. And God was not finished with man. He did not dismiss man. He sought to restore man back to himself. That's the kind of God we have. And that's what he is interested in doing. And we are introduced in that in Genesis chapter 3. And really all of the pages of Scripture, from the book of Genesis all the way down to the book of Revelation, are about God seeking to redeem man back to himself. And we see that in those pages of Scripture. And God has been long-suffering and patient towards them. And we know that uh, when uh, the godly generations of Seth and the ungodly generations of Cain came together, uh, we know that uh, God pronounced judgment upon uh, the earth. And He said that He would destroy all the earth. But the Bible tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so Noah built an ark under the, uh, under the instruction of God. And uh, the Bible tells us that Noah did everything that God told him to do. And there's a lesson for us there. We must do everything that God tells us to do. Uh, it is His earth, it is, uh, this world is His, and therefore we, as His children, have a responsibility to be obedient to Him. But something that I find Noah doing here in chapter number 8 
It's something that God did not command him to do. He built an altar unto the Lord. And up to this point, I think it is interesting to know that Noah, it is repeated of his life that he did according to what God had commanded him. It says that over and over again in chapter number 7, in chapter number 6. And in chapter number 8, we see God giving specific instructions to Noah. But as Noah comes out of the ark, he does something that God did not command him to do. He does something out of his own will, his own volition. He does something for God based upon what he's been observing over the last couple hundred years. And so we see this message this morning that there is only one thing to do. I want us to consider, we come to chapter number 8 in Genesis 8, we see first of all that God remembered Noah. God remembered Noah. The Bible tells us in verse 1, and God remembered Noah and every living thing and all cattle that was with him in the ark. Now, I think that our remembrance is brought back to Genesis chapter 6, verse eight and nine, verse 7 and 8, where the Bible says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. And notice in verse 8, the Bible tells us, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we know that judgment came, and it was 150 days when the waters covered the earth, and then they began to be abated. But here, in the midst of that, in the midst of judgment, in the midst of the earth being covered as representative of the judgment of God upon an unbelieving and a wicked world, we see that God remembers Noah. God remembers those who by faith completely trust in Him. He does not forget anything. He remembers all things. The one preeminent characteristic of Noah's life was his faith. It was not Noah uh, who, uh, that was uh, uh, more likable than anybody else. It was not because of Noah that God uh, uh, allowed him to come into the ark, but it was that his faith uh, that made him stand in contrast to the entire wicked world. And it was his faith that enabled him to live a life separate from this world. It was his faith that commended him to build an ark, to go into the ark, and to remain there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 gives us no doubt at all. The Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness. But then he adds again, which is by faith. So what we know and understand here is that by faith Noah built an ark. By faith Noah moved with fear. By faith Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his house. By faith Noah condemned the world. By faith, Noah became heir of the righteousness. And so we see that what Noah did was by faith. And therefore, God remembers Noah. You see, God, in the midst of His wrath upon this wicked world, in the midst of a world that if we look at that time, was completely covered with water, He remembers mercy. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2 tells us, O Lord, Habakkuk prays, and he says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech, and I was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. You see, God's grace towards Noah was manifested in the ark. God provided a way for Noah to be saved from the wrath to come. But God's mercy towards Noah was manifested in the ark also, where God withheld His wrath from Noah. You see, the ark provides two things, the grace of God and the mercy of God. The grace of God is God giving to Noah something he doesn't deserve, and His mercy is God withholding from Noah what he does deserve. He was saved by the ark. So we see that God remember Noah. We see the people of God in the ark. But number two, we see the power of God. And so because God remembers Noah, something is going to happen in this earth. And we know that at that time, as God remembers Noah, the earth is completely covered with water. And the Bible tells us in verse at the end of verse 1, And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the water is assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters returned from off the earth continually and after the end of it 150 days the waters were abated. So we see, I believe here, the power of God manifested. 
God not only remembers His people, but His power is manifested. You see, God had demonstrated His power when He caused the, the, uh, the, uh, the world to uh, the worldwide flood. God was again here demonstrating His power by commanding everything to stop and to return. You see, the wind passed. The Bible tells us the fountains stopped. The Bible says the rain was restrained. The waters were returned. These words cannot be separated from God's direct involvement in the restoration of the earth. We know that the, uh, the water came from heaven, and the Bible says that God restrained the rain. The Bible says that God caused the water to return from the fountains of the deep that had been broken up by God Himself, and God caused those things to return back to them. And it is evident for us that throughout the pages of Scripture, we are reminded constantly of the power of God, that God can do all things because He is God. Psalm 135 verse 7 says, He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, he maketh lights for the rain. He bringeth the wind out of his treasuries. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 4. Some questions are asked as this. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? If thou can tell, it's God. You see, it is God that does all things. And we're reminded as we are in Genesis, when God created the world, it is interesting to know that everything that is created is also kept by the power of God. You see, we are hanging in the balance. It's not like the earth is sitting on a stick. It's spinning on itself. It's got a perfect rotation. It's the exact distance from the sun it needs to be to have the heat. It's the exact distance from the moon for us to have the tides that we need. You see, if, if this world was out of place, out of order, and out of control, we would not be here. And God reminds Noah once again, has no doubt he knows that the water is covered by the water. He knows the power of God as the waters are returned, removed, as the wind of God passes through the earth. Psalm 148.8 says, Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind... Fulfilling His Word. Exodus chapter 14 verse 21. You remember when Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. You see, God defied the natural world. He disrupted man by this flood. God would prove His great power and might in, that, in what He accomplished in this judgment upon the unbelieving world. God also defied the natural world. He disrupted man by the ten plagues in Egypt, if you remember. God proved His great power and His might in what He accomplished in His judgment upon the hardened heart of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. But I believe, even to a greater extent, God defied the natural world. He disrupted man when He became a man without ceasing to be God. He proved His power over sickness, over the human body, over the waters. And as Christ came to the climax of His ministry, he died on the cross at the hand of His creation, but after three days God raised Him from the dead. You see, throughout the pages of Scripture, we are constantly reminded of the power of God. So God remembered Noah. We see the people of God, the power of God. But thirdly, I believe here we see the patience of Noah. I don't know how you would feel, but I think I know how I would feel after being 150 days in a boat. No, thank you. Uh, I, I can go fishing, but I, I'm not into the, you know, long trips. And I remember we, I was uh, perhaps when I was a kid, we went, uh, took a trip to Europe. We were going to Bulgaria for a mission trip, and we drove down through Italy. And from Italy to Greece, you had to take a ferry, and we uh, pulled the car in the ferry, and we took the ferry, and uh, the, uh, the 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 sea was quite boisterous. And uh, the man that was with us, uh, his name was Didier, and he uh, began to throw up and to get sick. And I thought to myself, I can't wait till this thing stops. Uh, the winds were uh, so strong and the waves were so strong, even for just a short period of time, I thought to myself, I can't wait to get out of here. But this has been 150 days. 
Now, I want us to consider the patience of Noah here because there is great value as seen in Noah's behavior. If we follow the timeline, it does not seem that Noah was in a hurry to step off the ark based upon what we read. But after all, the question is this, why would he be in a hurry? Let me give you the timeline, and we've read the passage this morning, but let me give you the timeline. The rain came down for 40 days and for 40 nights at the onset. The waters continued to prevail on the earth for about 110 days after that. This brings the total to 150 days of water covering the earth. The waters began to be abated, the Bible tells us, after the 150th day. The ark came to rest on the 17th day of the 7th month, which was another 74 days later. Forty days later, the tops of the mountain could be seen. Seven days later, Noah sent out a dove. Seven days later, sent out a dove the second time. Seven days later, Noah sent out the dove the third time. Noah removed the cover of the ark, and then 57 days later, he left the ark. It was four months, in other words, 121 days from the, ta- from the time the ark rested on Ararat to the time Noah exited the ark. In other words, Noah was in the ark for 375 days. The total calculation would be one year and ten days. Now, I'm reading this, and as he's sending out the dove the second time, third time, I'm like, let's go. <laughs> I'm reading, why is he waiting? But I believe here that patience come, comes as we wait on the Lord. You see, Noah did not step into the ark until God told him to come. And Noah is not going to step outside of the ark until God tells him to go. You see, Noah was not so attached to this world that he couldn't wait to leave the presence of God to go, where, to, to go and to do what he wanted to do. God had brought him into the ark, and he was not leaving until God told him to go forth out of the ark. There's a lesson for us here. Then when we go through this life, and perhaps there's a tempest and trouble in our lives, it would do good for us to wait for God to speak to us. It would be good for us to be patient and to simply do this, wait on the Lord. The Bible does tell us that they that wait upon the Lord are those that will renew their strength. Why? Because our strength comes from the Lord. I wonder how often uh, we try to rush in and out of the presence of God so we can get busy doing the things we want to do in this world. I wonder how often we rush through prayer so we can start eating. I wonder how often we can't wait to get out of church so that we can go eat or do whatever else we have planned in our lives. And we are so anxious to get up, to get out of the presence of God. But Noah's not in a hurry. As a matter of fact, we see, in my estimation, he's waiting a little too long. But he did not move until God spoke to him. The patience of Noah. And there's a lesson for us there that the Bible does tell us that the trial of our faith worketh patience. You see, when we go through the trials of life, God is teaching us to wait on him to be patient. And really, patience is this, is simply God's people waiting on the Lord. So God remembered Noah, we see the people of God, the power of God, the patience of Noah, but fourthly, I see the picture for Noah. And it's interesting here, we note there's two birds, if you would. God, uh, or Noah, sends out first the raven, and then he sends out the dove. Now, it is interesting to note that the Bible tells us that the raven went to and fro until the waters were abated. So the Bible doesn't tell us that the raven came back. But the dove went out and went back, and we see that three times, and the third time it was sent out, it did not come back. In verse number 7, the Bible says, And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro, until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Now, I believe there's a picture for us here in the raven and the dove, and uh, I believe that there's everything in the Scripture is there for a reason. Uh, There's no accident, there's no kind of mystical thing here, but... I do believe that as we study what the raven is in the, in the Word of God, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 17, The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the raven of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagle shall eat it. We know according to the Bible that a raven is a scavenger. He eats off of dead flesh. 
They are mischievous in nature. The raven could represent, I believe in this passage, the carnal heart that takes up the world. The carnal heart that can't wait to go out in the world because the raven apparently never came back. He went to and fro until the waters were abated. But this stands in contrast with the dove. Verse 8, the Bible tells us, He sent out forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark. The Bible tells us in Psalm 55, verse 6, And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away, and be rest. You see, on the other hand, con contrasted to the raven, the dove represents the gracious soul uh, that finds no rest for its foot, no solid peace, no satisfaction in this world. You see, Noah sent out the dove in order to receive a sign that the waters had abated. He did not look himself to see if the waters had abated. Nowhere do you find until he had uh, the complete assurance that the waters were abated that Noah finally looked and he saw the dry land. After the first and second time, Noah did not look to see if the waters had abated. But the dove brought a message to him. You see, on the second time, Noah sent forth the dove. The dove brought back an olive leaf. The olive branch, really, and the olive tree represents peace. It was not the raven that brought this message. It was the dove. The raven had nothing to bring to Noah. The world, by the way, has nothing to bring to man. The dove brought an olive leaf, a message of peace to Noah. In the same manner, on the baptism of Christ, a dove came down and with a voice of God that says this, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Christ came forth not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might have peace. You see, Christ brought a message of peace. The dove is bringing a message of peace, saying that God has been satisfied, and now that God God is at peace with man, that the world through him might be saved. Verse 13 says, And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark. So after all that, he finally removes the covering and looked, the Bible says. And behold, he said, the face of the ground was dry. So we see that after the wrath of God has been manifested in His judgment upon a wicked world, God remembers Noah. We not only see that God remembers Noah, but number two, we see God revealed unto Noah. The Bible tells us in verse number 15 that God is now going to speak. After what takes place here in Noah, and after Noah is waiting on the Lord, finally God now speaks in verse 15, and the Bible says, And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons and thy son's wife with thee. And we know he instructed him to bring everything out of the ark. But I want us to consider two things about God's revelation to Noah. First of all, we see God's direction. God told Noah, Go forth of the ark. And there's a lesson here we learn here is this, that God had told Noah to come into the ark, which signified for us that God was already in the ark waiting for Noah to come in. But now God tells Noah to go forth, which signifies that God was with Noah in the ark all along. You see, Noah did not move until he was commanded. And we noted earlier that Noah patiently waited for the Lord. We now learn that we must obey, uh, we, we must only be moved at the direction of God. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. You see, Noah had seen that the earth was dry. How easy it is for us to get ahead of God, to rush headlong without first seeking divine direction. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him, and he wasn't going to stop now. You see, God will direct our lives. God does give us commands to obey, but those are only followed and heeded when we have humbled ourselves in His sight. And there is no doubt here that Noah is not seeking to rush out of the presence of God. It seems to us that he is enjoying the presence of God. He's enjoying the salvation of God. He's reveling in the fact that God has saved him from his wrath. And so therefore, there's no reason to move until he commands. 
In God's revelation, we see God's direction, but we see also Noah's departure. And so Noah is going to go out of the ark. In verse number 18, the Bible says, And Noah went forth, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kind went forth out of the ark. Now, we see Noah departed. Uh, I want us to note two words that we find in verse 17. God told Noah, Bring forth, what's the next two words? With thee. With thee. I think those are important words. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, we understand that God created all things, all living creature, and then He told Adam to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God had given man His creation. He gave man a responsibility over His creation, and in this flood, we understand that this responsibility was still in place. Noah did not neglect the responsibility that God gave to man. Because Noah adhered to the word of God, he was unable to fulfill his earthly responsibility. It is impossible for man to fulfill his or her earthly responsibilities without obedience and submission to God's divine word. People often strive to have meaning in life. But to have true meaning in life, one must not separate himself from what God has ordained. And these animals were with Noah. You see, God did not say here, He, he didn't say, Noah, you go and uh, you know, bring my animals with you. No, the understanding was that these were Noah's responsibility and they were to go with him. God had entrusted to man and he is still entrusted to man. And Noah is fulfilling his responsibility. So we see God's revelation, we see God's direction, but we also see Noah's departure. But thirdly, and we're done here, and I really well, this is what I want to focus on this morning, is this God. Uh, we not only see uh, God's remembrance, God's revelation, but thirdly, we see God's reveling. And what I mean by that is God rejoicing. God reveled in Noah as he thought about Noah. Uh, it, it caused him to rejoice, to have joy, to, uh, uh, to, to, to feel good about what Noah was doing. Now notice here what happens, and the Bible says after Noah departs the ark, everybody's coming out, and there's uh, perhaps something new, and I perhaps thought, well, you know, let's go build a house. Let's at least put a tent tonight, or uh, we've got to get the fire going, or whatever the case may be, whatever is in the mind of man to take care of himself. But that's not what Noah does. We see, first of all, as we think about God's reveling, we see, number one, Noah's acknowledgement. So the first thing that Noah is going to do here, he's going to acknowledge God. You see, the first thing we see done in this new world was an act of, of worship. He, Noah acknowledged God's mercy. He, he acknowledged God's power. He acknowledged God's holiness. He acknowledged God's faithfulness. What is most significant about this altar is that God did not ask for it. Noah offered it of his own will. Although it was not commanded, it was the first and the only thing that Noah considered doing when he got out of the ark. You see, Noah built an altar and made an offering unto the Lord and all the clean, of all the clean animals. This would be the first, by the way, of 11 altars that are recorded for us in the book of Genesis. Abraham built five altars. Isaac would build one altar and Jacob would build four altars. But this is the first altar that we see. We know uh, Cain and Abel had offered a sacrifice, but the Bible doesn't mention altar. But the Bible here mentions altar. Noah built an altar. It is a, not only a place to offer to the Lord, but it is a place to set up as a memorial for the Lord. You see, the altar is the place of worship and thanksgiving. The first thing Noah did when he left the ark was not build a house or plant a crop. The first thing he did was worship God. I believe Jesus Christ reminds us of that in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the Bible says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things 
What things he was talking about, do not care for uh, the uh, raiment for the body and for food and what you shall eat, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of these things, the peripheral things of this world, will be added unto you. God will take care of that. I was reading a commentary, Matthew Henry said, he might have said, I have but seven sheep to begin the world with, and must one of these seven be killed and burned for an offering? Were it not better to defer it until we have great plenty? No, to prove the sincerity of his love and gratitude, he cheerfully gives the seventh, of his, uh, the seventh to his God as an acknowledgement that all was his and owing to him. Serving God with our little is the way to make it more. And we must never think that wasted, uh, we must never think that wasted with which God is honored. You see, the first thing Noah did was acknowledge God. You see his mind perhaps now as this ark. Do you remember when Noah came into the ark and God shut the door? What would he see? He would see a world that lied in wickedness. He would be reminded of the last time he saw this world. Of the great wickedness that was going on in this world. And that every imagination or the thought of man's heart was only evil continually. And now the door is open and the first thing that Noah considers... He acknowledges God and who He is and says, God, you deserve my praise. You deserve my worship. You deserve my thanksgiving. You see, in relief, we often forget God who delivered us. When it seemed that life would now get back to the normal routine, Noah would not let this solemn moment pass from him where he could take this time to acknowledge God. It would do us well before we go to the business of life and to the things that God has entrusted us with as we are stewards in this life, as we've been learning in Sunday school, that we would simply start our lives, our days, with simply acknowledging Him and who He is. Be thankful for who He is, for His mercy, for His holiness, and that it to be a sentiment in our lives. But often, you see, after the trouble, we... It is easy to trust the Lord in the troubled times. In the troubled waters, it is easy to trust the Lord when He carries us through the difficult times, but often when the difficult time is past and now things have been restored to what we think is a normal routine and normal life, we often, that is an opportunity for us to forget all about God who delivered us and who carried us through that in the first place. Why? Because now we got to get back to our lives. And so I submit to you this morning that as we consider the flood and we consider what God was doing uh, in humanity, as we think about uh, how God uh, uh, had all the waters back to where they were in the first place, I believe that here that we see that there is only one thing to do, and that is to acknowledge God, Amen. to worship Him, to be thankful for what He's done. So we not only see Noah's acknowledgement, but number two, we see God's acceptance. In verse 21, the Bible says, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thi everything living as I have done. Uh, now I want you to think about the implication of God's acceptance. I, I, I do not think for a moment that God smelled the literal flesh of the animals burning. You know what was sweet to God? Was the heart of Noah. That God had seen that God had seen. I didn't ask him to do this. But he did it of his own will. He acknowledged me. And this offering was simply Noah making a testimony to God, says God, it's all about you. And before I go on in my life, help me to stop and acknowledge who and who you are. And the fact that you're my creator and I am submitted to you. And God sees the heart of Noah. He sees the decision that Noah made. And that's pleasing to God. It's a sweet smelling savor. I believe with all of my heart that there's nothing sweeter to God than a heart that is completely given to him and says, God, how you are great. I want to do what you want me to do. I'm submitted to your will. God, this is all about you and I acknowledge you. And God is satisfied with that. Now what is interesting to me is that as he continues, this is what God said. 
Based upon what Noah did, he says, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Notice, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now, I want to pause here. Isn't that what God said that condemned the world earlier? In chapter 6, God says, I'm going to destroy this earth because every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart is evil continually. God said, and so therefore I'm going to destroy the earth. But here, God looks at what Noah has done out of his free will, out of his acknowledgement of God, and God smells that. It is sweet to him. It is something that he enjoys above everything else. And God says that, although I know the imagination of man's heart, that it is evil from his youth, I will not again curse the ground. You see, Noah was not perfect. The heart of Noah was evil. The heart of his sons were evil. And we're going to find that at a later time. And so God acknowledges the heart of man, but there's a lesson that's been taught for us where God now uh, speaks of his long-suffering to man, although he knows full well the heart of man. You see, the Bible makes it clear that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is not one person in this world that's Always done right. As a matter of fact, every single person in this world has gone against God. Has been the enemy of God. And God knows that. But yet, God still seeks to redeem man. And God says, now, judgment is coming. To, I believe, a, a severe extent than we, what we saw in the flood. Judgment is coming. There's going to be one day the great white throne judgment for all those throughout the parade of human history that had rejected God and the, and the Messiah. There's going to be the great white throne judgment. For the believer, there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ. But as we think about the judgment of God upon the unbelieving world, God is basically during this period saying, this has appeared for you to get right with me. And so in this world, as people are shaking their fist in the face of God, as people are uttering all kinds of profanity towards God and His name, God is patient and long-suffering. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God acknowledges the heart of man. He knows it from his youth. He is evil at heart. Yet God is long-suffering and says, I know that you're evil at heart. But I know that there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There is a, a salvation that is full and free in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so God accepts Noah. He accepts the offering. And He says, I will not again do this until the final judgment come. You see, God was pleased by the act of Noah as a sweet savor unto Him. But we also see the heart of man was sinful after the flood as it was before the flood. And we know as we work our way towards Genesis 11 that it's not going to take very long for the Tower of Babel to come about. But God in this message, and we'll see next week in chapter 9, He sends a message, a message of this, of hope, of peace, of forgiveness, of grace towards those whose heart are evil. So who are you talking to? I'm talking about me. If you know your own heart and you know the tendency of your own heart, you know how quickly we can do evil and how quickly we can excuse it away. And God knows that. And God knew that that was present in Noah and in Noah's children. But God still saved them. Why? Because they trusted Him by faith. And today, salvation is full and free for anyone that would acknowledge their sin in the sight of God. And would say, God, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that I deserve your wrath, as we clearly see here in the book of Genesis. But I also acknowledge that you came to die on the cross to pay for my sin debt. And ultimately... When Jesus Christ died on the cross, that was the God was satisfied. You see, 
It was by the stripes of Jesus Christ, according to Isaiah 53, that we are healed. The Bible says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Christ, it pleased the Lord. In other words, as, the, as Jesus Christ died on the cross, we understand all that went on. But the Bible tells us that He, Christ, became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And so although we have evil hearts and although we don't deserve the grace of God, He freely extends it to us and reminds us that He is satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ. He is satisfied in the way He has provided. And Jesus Christ rose from the dead as a testimony that the sacrifice was pleasing to Him. And anyone and everyone who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith will be saved. Amen. The Bible says that if we confess our sins... And believe in our heart that great God hath raised him from the dead. We shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, no, it must have been you know, better looking than everybody else. That's why God, no, no, no. God once again acknowledges the heart of Noah. And says it's evil from his youth. But Noah chose faith in God believed in the sacrifice of Christ by faith, knew that the judgment was coming. And so that does two things for us. I believe that we ought to be grateful for the salvation that we have. And if you're not saved this morning, you can right now in the quietness of your heart, repent of your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on the cross, and He'll save you instantly. He will. But there's also some lessons for us, I believe, in the Christian life, that once we trust God by faith, we often try to rush through this life. Or we ought to follow the example of Noah and just sometime pause a little while, consider who God is. And would we ever dare to perhaps do something that God did not ask us to do? Would we dare at times in our lives to simply stop out of the business of our lives and simply acknowledge God and who He is. And in a certain extent, that's what church is. Church, in an ex to a certain extent, is for us to, to stop out of the business of our lives and to acknowledge God. Amen. And to be reminded by His Word of who He is. To be reminded by those hymns that we so sing that are filled with who God is and His person and His salvation towards mankind and to pause and to acknowledge Him and to be thankful. And that heart goes up to God and God is pleased. And may the Lord help us. I pray to God that God would be pleased with this church. That when we meet together and worship the Lord together and study the Word of God together, may God see our hearts above anything else. And may God be pleased with our offering to Him. May He be pleased by our acknowledgement to Him. And I believe as I was reading this, the Lord spoke to my heart and convicted my heart. That it's easy even in my situation as you, uh, the business of life and you got to do things and you have to take care of, you know, five children and there's always noise all around. There's always something going on. There's always something to do. But every once in a while it's good to pause and to stop. Instead of getting frustrated with the children, I ought to perhaps stop and thank God for my children. Instead of being uh, too busy doing other things for the Lord, maybe I ought to pause and thank God for calling me in the ministry and for doing work in my life, for saving me. You see, we must have those pauses in our lives. And I believe that in our hearts, everything in our lives will come out of that. You see, in life, there's really one thing to do. That determines everything else. Sometimes we can get so busy for God that we forget God. We can so often boast of ourselves and say, oh, look, this is what I'm doing for God. That in the midst of us serving God, we are totally forgetting who we're serving. And may the Lord help us to pause and to say, God, I acknowledge you and who you are. 
And I believe that that will affect every area of our lives. May we never be too busy doing things for God that we forget Him. Let's pray. Father.